All right, guys, so what we're going to be looking at here is we're going to be applying this graphical analysis that we've been talking about. We're going to apply it in a slightly different way. What I mean by that is we're going to be looking at tables of values rather than specific functions. So before we do that, let's just do a quick review of a couple of things that we talked about, okay? Just because uh, make sure we're all on the same page. So if we're talking about a relative max or a min, what we have anytime we have that is our function reaches a highest point relative to the points around it. So we have a max there, or we've got a minimum where it reaches its lowest point relative to the points around it. And we always use X values to describe it. So in this case, at X equals two and X equals negative two and positive one, we have our max and our min. A function is increasing any time as we move from left to right, our Y values are going up as we move in that direction. And it's also where the first derivative is a positive value. So in both of those places that I just highlighted, we have our function increasing. We also have our function decreasing on that interval that we're looking at right there. Um, and again, we those the only place that those can change from increasing to decreasing or vice versa is where we have our critical points where the first derivative is equal to zero. So on that part right there, it's less than zero. A point of inflection is where our function changes from concave up to concave down. So if you remember, in this, that's where our second derivative is equal to zero. Before, anytime we look at, not before, but anytime we look at our function and it looks like a frowny face, we say that we are concave down or that the second derivative is less than zero. And anytime we're concave up, our second derivative is greater than zero. So that's just a brief review and all of that should seem fairly familiar as far as what's happening on the graphs. Now, what, again, what we're going to be looking at is we're still going to be looking at functions, but instead of being given a specific function like this one right here where we know what the graph looks like or we know what the function is, instead what we're going to be given is select derivative and second derivative and function values at different x values. Okay, so we'll have this table of values. We will not know what the original function is. We do not need to discover what the original function is. Instead, we're going to try and make some guesses, if you will. And they won't be guesses. They will be things that we can assume, not, not, not even assume, things that we can know about the function based solely on the table of values. Now, one thing that you have to be really careful of, so we're going to start looking at these table of values in just a second, is if I look at a function and I know what's happening at x equals 2, and then I know what's happening at x equals 1 as well, just because I know what's happening at x equals 1 and x equals 2 does not mean that we know that what is happening between those. I don't know what's happening at x equals 1.5 or x equals 1.75. And it's not up to us to guess what is happening at those points. Because I don't know what a function's doing. For all I know, I've got a point here and maybe I've got another point here on the graph. And the graph goes up and down and up and down and up and down. I don't know what the function looks like. So I can't make any sort of assumptions. So if I had this table of values, for example, and I'm notice my first line is f of x, I have no idea what is happening between x equals negative 1 and x equals positive 2. Nor do I know between 2 and 4, or 4 and 5, on and on and on. And you don't have to worry about it. You just say, OK, I can see um, that, that I, I just can't make that assumption. So here's what we're going to look at. You'll see various questions like this. The first question that we're going to look at is what is the minimum number that of maxima that this function will attain? Now, maxima is just plural for maximum. So this is saying, based on this information that I have, how many maximums, at the very least, is my function going to have? Now again, there could be a million of them because we don't know what's happening between the given x values. But if we just assume that um, we don't know, then one thing has to be true when we have a maximum. And that is my function has to change from increasing to decrease. Another way to say that is my first derivative values have to go from positive to negative. So the one thing this is not asking is it's not asking where do I have a maximum, okay? It, we cannot tell that based solely off of this table of values. I'd like to say, for example, that right here at x equals negative 1, I have a maximum. We'll talk about that in just a second. I'd also like to say that it happens at 
x equals positive 7. Two things, I'd like to say that those are the answers, but we cannot say that for sure, and we're going to talk about why here in just a second. Now, we talked about what has to happen in order for us to have a maximum. Our first derivative has to change from a positive number to a negative number somewhere along the line. The best that we can do when I'm looking at this table of values is say, okay, I can see the first derivative is positive at x equals negative 2. That means at that point, my function's increasing. Then I can see over here at x equals positive 2 that I have a negative first derivative value, so that means it's decreasing at that point. So somewhere in between here, and I don't know what happened, but somewhere in between those two numbers, I can say that I knew that I had a maximum. I'd like to believe that it happened at x equals one, negative 1 because that's where the first derivative is equal to 0, but I can't just make that assumption. So what I would say is from negative 2 to positive 2, somewhere along the line, I had to have a maximum because there's no way I can go from increasing to decreasing without having a maximum somewhere in there. The same thing holds true from somewhere between 5, positive 5, and positive 8. Because I go from a positive first derivative value to a negative first derivative value, I'd like to say that it happens at x equals 7, but I don't know that for a fact. I can't say that that is where the we're going to have a maximum for sure. So I, I just don't say that at all. So those are the two intervals, and we're done. Notice there are no other things that we have to do. We don't have to try and figure out what is going on in this graph. If I wanted to say, if I were to ask you where is there a on what intervals are there a minimum, then you would say, okay, I'm decreasing right there and I'm increasing after that. So somewhere between two and five, I can say that there will be a minimum. I just don't know the x value at which that occurs. In order for us to have a point of inflection, the second derivative has to change signs. So now if I'm asking about the second derivative, I would say, okay, I can see that my second derivative value is negative there and positive there. So somewhere between negative 1 and positive 4, I'm going to have a point of inflection. I don't know where. I'd like to say it's at x equals 2, but I can't say that for sure. Also, between positive 4 and positive 7, my first, my second derivative values change from positive to negative. Somewhere along the line, I have a second point of inflection. So the minimum number of points of inflection that I can have is 2 in this case. I could have more because I don't know what this function looks like. But at the very least, I can have two of them occurring. Now, another thing that people that the AP test likes to ask is we have this table of values and we're asked other things as well. Like what is the average rate of change in, on this interval from negative 1 to positive 7? Well, don't forget average rate of change is just the slope between two points on a line. So this is going to be my x1, this is going to be my x2, so I'll have 7 minus negative 1. And then on top, I would have my y2, that is my function value when x equals 7. So in case, this case, that would be 3. And then the x value at negative 1 is 5, so I would have... All right, we are ready for our next group of... All right, so if we're looking at something like instantaneous rate of change, that's different than average rate of change. Oops, I got ahead of myself. Sorry, there was a little uh, confusion there in the school. So here, we're not done with average rate of change yet. Okay, so I've got, what I have to do now is I figure out this slope. So I get negative 2 divided by 8. If you want to simplify that down, you get negative 1 fourth. And that is my average rate of change. Again, just apply the definition of what these are. Reading tables is easier because we never have to evaluate any function. All the evaluating is done for us. We just have to interpret what's going on. So there's very little algebra involved. Now, the instantaneous rate of change, what we have to realize on this one is another name for instantaneous rate of change is the derivative. Okay. So on a derivative, that's just asking when x equals 5, what is the slope of the tangent line? And hopefully we can see that in this case at x equals 5, the answer is 2 because that's what our slope would be at that point. Now, what happened, usually that the type of table that we just saw is what you'll see on the AP test. Every once in a while, they'll give you one like this where they give us more information because they tell us what is going on on an entire interval. Notice in the, these problems, it's telling us what is happening between each of these numbers. 
Because of that, basically what these are is these are just super fancy number lines. Like if I look at my F prime of X line, that's like saying, okay, I've got my number line here. I can see that the first derivative is equal to zero at one. So I put that one on the number line. And at six, that's also on the number line. And then before x equals negative, or x equals positive one, I can see that the first derivative is positive. After negative, after positive one, I can see that those values are negative. And then after six, I can also see that those values are negative. So just by looking at this and kind of interpreting what it's saying, I can see that I have a maximum at x equals one and neither a max nor a min at x equals six because my first derivative changes from a negative value to a negative value. So it doesn't change at all, I guess is a better way to say it. So because I know what's happening on these intervals, I can make a few more assumptions. So how many maximums occur? I know for a fact that there is one because there's only one place where the first derivative changes from positive to negative. Just like I said, there are no minimums because there's nowhere that it changes from negative to positive. Okay, and that's what this is saying. I don't have any minimums because there is nowhere, according to this table of values, that my first derivative changes from a negative value to a positive value. Points of inflection, very similar. I can see that at x equals negative one, I have a point of inflection. And I can see at x equals six, that I also have a point of inflection because that is where the second derivative changes sign. That's what a point of inflection is, is wherever our second derivative changes sign from positive to negative or vice versa. And because I can see what's happening on the intervals rather than a specific x value, I can make a lot more assumptions about what is true about the original function. Lastly, if our graph, one thing that shows up on the AP test every once in a while is what happens if the derivative does not exist, but the function does. So in other words, what we, we would see is a corner or a cusp. You'll notice if I saw something like this at x equal, let's just say that this is x equals two, okay? What that's saying is that maybe this point is two, three. So I could say, I'm making all this stuff up, so it's not like you should know what this function is ahead of time. But we could say at x equals two that f of two equals three, but because there is a corner there, I could say that f prime of two does not exist. So that shows up every once in a while on the, on the AP test. I wouldn't worry about it too much, but that is what happens if we have a corner or a cusp. On the table, you would see a table of values, and we'd have our x values up here. You'd see two. f of x, we'd have three. And f prime of x, it would just say does not exist, or DNE, or something like that. So hopefully this makes sense as far as how to read a table and how to get information from that about the original function. If you have any other questions, please come on in.